<laughs> okay, so we will start. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, Boa noite, as I say. Welcome back to the series Brazil 200 Years of Independence, History, Language and Culture. The topic today is the south of Brazil. Uh, it's a topic I know very well because that's the region where I come from. So my name is Marco Schamnathel. Uh, I teach Portuguese at the Barbados Language Center, Barbados uh, Community College. And uh, this series of presentations and workshops and discussions is presented by the Embassy of Brazil in Bridgetown and the Barbados Language Center, the Barbados Community College. So today we will have a presentation that is a little bit different. I will uh, make it a commented presentation. So feel free, feel free to interrupt and ask uh, questions. I also see uh, there are people here from the south of Brazil that are actually present in this presentation. So uh, if you want to contribute and also help to uh, present the south of Brazil, you're all um, welcome, okay? So what I will do tonight is I will show you a few things about the south of Brazil. First of all, I would like to show the area. So the south of Brazil, as we were discussing in previous presentations, uh, Brazil is made up of 27 different states. And obviously, as you can guess, the south of Brazil here is in orange and it's comprised by three big states. Uh, the state of Paraná, which is the most northern state, the state of Santa Catarina, which is in the middle, and the state of Rio Grande do Sul. So Paraná uh, borders Paraguay and borders Argentina here, and also uh, other states in Brazil. Santa Catarina borders just Argentina, and Rio Grande do Sul borders Argentina and um, Uruguay. Uh, we also discussed in other presentations about Tordesillas line. Remember when the Pope decided that the world would be divided in two between the Spaniards and the Portuguese, and the Tordesillas line went along more or less here, our, the way I'm showing you with the mouse, uh, up to a place called Laguna in Santa Catarina. So actually the east uh, of that line was supposed to be part of Spain. So most of the state of Santa Catarina, of Paraná, and also of uh, Rio and the Sul, they were supposed to actually be part of uh, Spain. But uh, the Portuguese managed to control the area and kind of seize this for themselves. So what we are talking about, I will <clears throat> show you a few features of the south of Brazil, and I will start uh, and I will do the whole thing by showing you the three capitals of those three states, which are Curitiba in the state of Paraná, Florianópolis in the state of Santa Catarina, and Porto Alegre in the state of Rio Grande do Sul. Okay, so uh, and by doing that, uh, this is also kind of uh, giving you a glimpse on how Brazilian cities look like, especially in the south of uh, Brazil. Uh, let me. Uh, shift here to, I'm actually closing this, and I will start showing you the city of Curitiba, and I will also comment, and you can also ask if you have any questions, okay? Um, so this is Curitiba, have a glimpse of how a Brazilian city looks like. Curitiba is considered one of the greenest cities in Brazil and in the world because it has a lot of incentives of recycling and a lot of parks, a lot of green areas. One of the main characteristics that you also see here, if you look at the traffic, you see it's always one hand traffic avoiding a lot of jams. So one road goes in one direction, the other in the other. So cars hardly cross uh, on roads. So There's always a single hand. Okay? as you can observe it. And also something uh, which is interesting is, uh, go back, get the right here. Oh. So here you see there is an exclusive corridor. Cars are on, on the outside of the road, which are the corridors and buses are in the middle of the corridor. And buses have priority in public transportation. So whenever a bus comes to a crossing where there are traffic lights, there are sensors in the bus 
that so to say open the traffic lights and stop the rest of the traffic so the bus can pass so and they travel in exclusive uh, corridors so that the uh, trip is faster if you are on a bus for example i come i have a place in curitiba so whenever i'm in curitiba and i want to go downtown it's faster by me to go for, for me to go by bus than um going by car so and cheaper so i prefer to actually take the bus to um, go downtown for example so see here you see this corridor again uh, to take this picture and you see the, the amount of green this is, two, this is a two million city right and it has a lot of green and a lot of parks Actually, Curitiba was a small city in, in the 1920s, and then it started to grow. And it had a lot of places like this one here. It's a quarry. And the quarry became an abundant place, and it was then transformed into a park. So there are several quarries in town that became parks. Okay, So it becomes a useful area instead of a dumping area or something like that. If you also observe in the background here, you see mountains. And those mountains, they are towards the coast. If we look again back at the map of Curitiba, uh, you will see Curitiba is about 60 kilometers away from the coast, but 1,000 meters above sea level. So it is on a mountain range. Uh, and that changes the climate of the place dramatically because we are far down in the south. This is also something very common in the south of Brazil, we have four seasons, okay? So we have winters, we have the fall, we have autumn, uh, sorry, the spring, and we have summer. And we also get very cold winters sometimes, under uh, zero degrees, obviously, Canadian would not say cold, but the region would not say it's cold. And some areas that even snows, okay? So this is the city of Curitiba. I will not have enough time to show you the whole video. Um, it's the botanical garden. I guess now you can see again, right? Yes. So. Ah! So as you can see, also like those cities, they are well developed and sometimes people have the, the wrong idea of how um, places in Brazil or in South America look like. Right? So you see some of the many parts. Okay. Now, I want to jump to another city. Uh, and this is the city of Florianopolis. If we zoom in, Florianopolis is on an island, and the island is called Santa Catarina, the same name as the state. And actually what is interesting, and I always use Florianopolis as an example, is if you look at the island of Santa Catarina, where the capital Florianopolis is on, it's a 600,000 people city. Uh, the island of Santa Catarina here, that is connected by a bridge to the continent, is half a square kilometer bigger than Barbados, okay? Uh, so Florianopolis, that is tiny when you zoom out into the south of Brazil, is actually the size of Barbados, just for you to also have an idea of the dimensions. And Florianopolis was colonized. Curitiba is, is a city that was colonized by a lot of European descendants from all over Europe, whereas Florianopolis is the majority of them came from the Azores, from an island. Island. And you can see, and you can see, Florianopolis is a coastal city. And this is the bus terminal of Florianopolis. A lot of the transportation is done by bus, not by train. So, our main means of transportation for the bus is airplanes and buses. As you can see, 
here, this is just the other view. Here we are on the coast and then the mountains are in the back. So the, the Brazilian coast along in the south of Brazil. Somebody has their microphone on. Can you please turn it on? So I could expect you. Um, what happens a lot in the south of Brazil is that the coastal line is not very broad, so to say. So soon the mountain range starts, okay? And that is what you see here again, also in the further south of Florianopolis. Here, a little bit of the coastline of Florianopolis. If there's people from the south of Brazil that are watching this, they are already missing a little bit their home land. Okay, now we come, when we go back to um, the map, we come to the most southern capital of Brazil, which is Porto Alegre. Porto Alegre is at the mouth of a big lagoon called Lagoa dos Patos, and uh, it has access to the sea here via the port uh, of Rio Grande. And that is where a lot of settlers also from Portugal first settled down. Uh, and actually, in general, the, the characteristics of the south of Brazil, it is very different from uh, the rest of Brazil because the south of Brazil was first, was later colonized. So the whole history that we learned about where the uh, slave uh, enslavement system happened uh, did not occur in that way in the south of Brazil, although there were black slaves uh, as well in the south of Brazil. But a lot of, uh, of people that settled down in the south of Brazil, they came either from the Middle East, they came uh, mainly from Europe and also some uh, from Asia. And that uh, gives the south of Brazil different cultural ethnic uh, characteristics as well. And uh, here we go. So this is uh, Porto Alegre. Um, so let's have a glimpse at uh, Porto Alegre. So this is not by the sea, but this is by the lake. Okay, with the sea there. Football stadium of my rival team from the Reds. Actually, I was born in this state, the state of Rio Grande do Sul. That's where I was born. See, Porto Alegre has an even port because it's black movies used on the beach. Let's jump forward. So, anyone has any comments or any questions so far? If not, I would like to come now to something that is a talk about the food of Southern Brazil. I have a lot of topics here and I hope I can cover them all. So the first thing I would like to cover here is. Uh, Churrasco. Have you ever heard about churrasco? Do you, know, you know what I'm talking about? For the non Brazilians here in this presentation. Do you have an idea what churrasco is? Barbecue. Barbecue. Barbecue, right. So I will <laughs> tell you a little bit about the tradition of Brazilian barbecue. Churrasco is this. Brazil's version of cowboy barbecue, invented by the gauchos, the Brazilian horsemen who herded cattle in the Rio Grande do Sul region of southern Brazil. Churrasco was originally a method of. We have a saying in southern Brazil, even a song that's called Churrasco 
e bom chimarrão. What is the there is a chimarrão, which is a green tea people drink uh, out of a calabash and a metal straw, and it's a drink to be shared. So you have one chimarrão, you fill it up, and you give it to somebody else, and it's a bitter tea, okay? Bitter green tea. Pasco was originally a method of spit roasting cuts of meat by the fire. Today, the steakhouse-style restaurants continuing this tradition of cowboy cooking are known as churrascarias. Enormous automated charcoal and wood rotisseries have replaced the outdoor fire pits, but the slow roasting and basting process remains much as it was nearly two centuries ago. Diners in churrascarias are presented with experience, an informal style of tableside service known as hojitsio. Gauchos clad in traditional dress are referred to as pasadores. Guests watch as they carve slices of sizzling meat with sword-length knives directly off the spit and onto the plate. As different cuts of meat emerge from the kitchen, roving pasadores continuously make their rounds of the restaurant's tables. It's all very tempting, and the experienced eaters know to pace themselves when asking for more. Here at Fogo Gichon in Sao Paulo, Unilever executive chef Steve Gilliba and CIA instructor Ileana de la Vega sample the various selections of the day. The lunch and dinner menu at Fogo Gichon features unlimited servings of 15 different cuts of meats. Cuts like the picanha, a thick sliced beef sirloin, seasoned with sea salt and garlic and bent into a trademark C shape so that it roasts evenly. Or the alcatra, delectable cuts from the top sirloin. Fralginha, a juicy and tender cut from the bottom sirloin. To balance out this endless parade of protein, churrascarias offer their guests a large self-service buffet of various salads, vegetables, and a variety of Brazilian side dishes. Definitely not your average salad bar. Other side dishes are presented tableside, such as warm cheese bread, fried bananas, and crispy polenta wedges. It all makes for quite a meal and a show, which may explain why the churrascaria concept has proved so successful here in the U.S. as well. Okay, uh, I guess I'm getting hungry now. Uh, I will also play here another video and explain a few things, okay? I'll leave it muted. And this here shows a little bit more like uh, what is the tradition in, in families. So Sunday is usually a churrasco day and we make uh, usually a churrasco in our families and we do that in special places that we have at home, um, either outside like the guys are doing it here, or we have a special constructed brick uh, grill that we call churrasqueira and we do that uh, we grill the meat there, okay? Uh, what is the tradition? So what happened, he, remember the guy said cowboy. Um, in the south of Brazil, there is an area called the Pampa, and I will show you later the Pampa. The Pampa is a grass, a natural grass area uh, that is ideal for cattle uh, raising. And it is said that the beef that comes out of the Pampas where uh, cows do not get any special uh, feeding from produced in mills, uh, it's the best meat in the world. So, and that applies for Uruguay, for the Pampa in Uruguay, Pampa in Argentina, and the Pampa in southern um, Brazil. Sometimes they cook, as you see here, whole ribs and, and whole cows, and it's really a very big feast. And it's almost like a staple food dish for Rasco um, for people in the south of Brazil. Uh, okay. So actually connected to that, I can show you now uh, what the Pampa looks like and you will understand what I'm talking about. I have here a series of links and this is the area that is the area that we have to not only, but where cattle is raised in the south of Brazil. So this is how the Pampa looks like. That is the also when we come back actually, to the to our map. 
and we look at the map. Uh, I come from an area in the state of Gansu in the mountains, okay? But further down, the second half of the state here towards Uruguay and Argentina is more or less flat. And it's this Pampa area that I'm talking about, okay? Nas infinitas planícies destes campos do sul, três países se encontram formando um destino turístico único. A fronteira oeste gaúcha. Um lugar que já foi palco de batalhas e revoluções históricas, hoje celebra a paz e a união entre povos hermanos que compartilham hábitos culturais e as belíssimas culturais e as belíssimas culturais. But you see here, for example, in the south of Brazil, you can actually walk into Uruguay. There is no border control, nothing where you see, you see these flags here, Brazil and Uruguay. And this is the border and you just walk across the border and uh, the borders are open. Hábitos culturais e as belíssimas paisagens do Pampa. This gives you an idea about the Pampa area. A gastronomia da fronteira é famosa pela qualidade das carnes e assados, que harmonizam perfeitamente com os vinhos e azeites produzidos na região. E o sabor fica ainda mais especial quando apreciado ao ar livre, em contato com a natureza exclusiva do lugar. A movimentada vida nas cidades e zonas de fronteira com seus free shops divide espaço com as lidas campeiras, que fazem parte do dia a dia do gaúcho da fronteira e pode ser vivenciada nas estâncias rurais e suas atividades turísticas. Conheça e se encante pela fronteira oeste do Rio Grande do Sul. Okay, that is the Pampa area. Uh, here, another, just some glimpse, I'm not show everything. How churrasco and big artist is prepared to hold slabs of ribs. They are cooked for hours, sometimes 12 hours and more. Or sometimes what is also normal, we grill it on big metal skewers. Uh, some of them rotate automatically in some manual. So you have to take them and they slowly cook as well. Always over charcoal. And it comes from the tradition of the gauchos, uh, where they would just do it in the Pampa area wherever they could find some shade and in open air, they would cook whatever was available. Okay? So that is the famous churrasco of the south of Brazil. Uh, now, I would like to come to something else. Uh, we go back now in our map to the state of Paraná. And in the state of Paraná, there is Curitiba. And on the coast of Paraná, there is a city called Moveches. And Moveches has an Amerindian tradition as well. And it mixes uh, cultures there. So, and the dish I would like to show you, the so-called barreado, is from the area of Moveches. It's very typical for Moveches. And have a look what this is about. Barreado comes from the word barro. And barro means mud. It's called the murdered one. And I think you will understand why. Have a look. I'm going to show you a little bit of our story here of Morretes, our barriado of Celeiro. Our barriado is traditional. I'm going to show you all the accompaniments that are going to be. Water, cebola. Para essa panela aqui são mais ou menos assim, um quilo de cebola. So she has all the ingredients and it's meat, right? Menos um quilo, um quilo e meio de tomate. Bem gostoso. 
que são as carnes. A gente usa paleta, mu. Vou colocar. Esse aqui é um caldo de carne, mais ou menos umas quatro colheres. Esse aqui é cominho. Duas colheres de cominho para essa quantia de barreado. Para não ficar muito gorduroso, não barre as gramas de beijo. Aqui você põe à vontade, então senão vai ficar muito salgado. Agora eu vou fazer uma massa que vai farinha e um pouquinho de trigo para a gente lacrar a panela, porque ela vai virar uma, tipo, uma panela de pressão, que daí vai sair o vapor para... A, casa, a carne cozinha só no vapor, 48 horas para cozinhar, então eu começo hoje cozinhando, aí ele vai à noite, ele descansa, daí depois eu abro, e daí a carne vai estar bem cozida, com essa massa eu vou lacrar a panela. Essa panela é uma panela de barro, a gente faz uma panela de barro para o barreado ficar bem gostoso, como era antigamente. Aqui está quase... And she also explains in the next video, very short video, how the dish is then prepared once it is cooked. The barriado. This is cassava flour. Very simple. So this is the barriado. Any questions, any comments so far? Hi, Dr. Marco. Good night. Uh, is it possible when you're playing the videos if you can turn them down just a little bit because it's competing with you? So I'm not hearing you clearly. Okay. Yeah, and I had to thank do you. the opposite right now to hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, it's a bit of a of a. Okay, I guess someone. Okay. So what I would like to do now also is show you uh, some of the areas in, in Brazil. Have you ever heard about cataratas do Iguaçu? Yes. What are the cataratas do Iguaçu? Who can explain it? Waterfalls. Waterfall. Yes. So the Cataratas de Iguaçu, it is said that if you know Niagara Falls and Cataratas de Iguaçu, the Niagara Falls are considered small compared to the Iguaçu waterfalls. And what is interesting, uh, we travel now in our map here to the same state of Paraná, but on the opposite side. And that is here, by Ciudad del Este, in Paraguay already. And we have here, Foz do Iguaçu and the Cataratas do Iguaçu, they are in the Foz do Iguaçu area. And what is interesting is that here there is Argentina, okay, by those three rivers. Here there is Brazil and here there is Paraguay. So the Iguaçu waterfalls actually are at the border of Brazil, Argentina, but very close to the border of Paraguay as well. So enjoy the Cataratas do Iguaçu. Have a look at that. So together with Rio, Cataratas do Iguaçu are one of the most famous spots, tourist spots in Brazil. People from all over the world come and see the Cataratas do Iguaçu. Uh, there are like bridges here, as you see, that you can walk, walk very close to the falls and see them. This one is called the Devil's Throat because of the rumbling sound it makes. So you can barely talk to each other when you are there. You see, there are several bridges in several areas that you can go and, and see the cataract. 
fell out this week was sweet. Actually, a little joke we have uh, as Brazilians because we share the borders with Argentina and the Cataratas are at the borders. And, and as you know, we are big rivals in football. And we Brazilians say that um, if you want to see the Cataratas better, you better go to the Argentinian side. And people say, oh, really, is the Argentinian side nice? We said, no, from there you can see the Brazilian side. That is our joke, okay, about the Cataratas. So uh, it was soon. So what a fun. And it's not just one or two falls, it's a chain of over a hundred different falls that come together, like almost like a, in a hoof shape, uh, a bit distorted, of course. Uh, and the volume of water is amazing. This is not the highest volume of water you can get. This is, a, I would say, a normal season. Sometimes all the whole area that you see becomes uh, falls if the volume of water is too high. Okay, so those are the cataracts because later you can watch more if you are interested in learning more. I just want to give you a glimpse, a bit of everything, right? The other thing I want to show you that is not so well known are the canyons, and the canyon of Itaim Bezinho in southern Brazil uh, is also a very interesting. Attraction. The canyon of Itaim Bezinho is very close to the area where I was born in the south of Brazil. So the canyon of Itaim Bezinho is here in this area here, okay, in some of the Zazentes in that area. Uh, since I'm talking about it, I can later, after I show this video, tell you something also about the area where I come from. So have a look at this. For you to have the perspective of how deep this canyon is, you have the very famous pine tree from the south of Brazil, which is the Araucaria tree. You see those sticks here, literally sticking out of the woods. Those are Araucaria trees. And an Araucaria tree can be about the size of at least a six, seven story building. Okay. Like our whatever, central bank in Barbados, the size of one tree. So if you bear that in mind that this is a massive, huge tree, you, have, you can have an idea on how deep this here is. Again, you see the other fire tree on the left, on the right. Actually, what is also interesting then is that let me come back to this. If you get this here, for example, for people interested in biology and geography, those is should be sorry. What is interesting is that if you travel from the top of the mountains, the area where I come from, to down to the coast, the vegetation changes completely because the climate is different, the kind of temperature is different. Whereas up here, you have those pine trees that are typical from the mountains. Down the mountain, which is sometimes a difference of a thousand meters, you can grow bananas. Okay, So bananas don't grow up here. Uh, where I come from, it's very hard to grow bananas because it's too cold in the winter. But the difference in temperature and in altitude is so uh, big that even the type of vegetation changes. 
This is the other target to win from the bottom. This is a wild spot. I also have a second video of penguins. Uh, I think it's more of the same. Yeah, it feels like another type of overview from another area. There are several penguins in that area, okay? Not just one, like six or seven different areas where you get penguins. For the sake of time, for the sake of time, I have to shift topics. So also in uh, the south of Brazil, you get areas that have vineyards. I would like to show you the, the following. Again, coming back to the map, if I zoom in, uh, I get a little bit of Brazil a little bit of everything in the area where I come from. Okay, I come from a place uh, called Santa Maria del Mar. Okay, which is here. Actually, I was born in another small village up from Santa Maria del Mar. So here, there are German descendants. Okay, in Santa Maria del Mar. When you come to this is a very touristic city called Gramado. When you go to Gramado, there is a mix of Germans and Italians there. Okay, so we have all German traditions in the south of Brazil, where I come from. But here you already have some Italian influence from the Veneto. And if you go to the area here of Garibaldi, South of Pilia, people there grow uh, grapes and produce wine because they are descendants of Italians. And if I go further down in a city called Ipochi, where I actually also studied, uh, there are uh, Japanese there, okay? So, and if you go further down Novo Hamburg or in areas like Porto Alegre, the capital, population is all mixed. So you get all those influences around. So like I used to say, uh, certainly some people already heard me saying this, it's like for me, although I'm a German descendant that grew up in Brazil, and sushi and sashimi is not a strange food or, or all the Italian foods and wines is not strange to me. It's very common. It's part of my own uh, culture as well. And what I would like to show you now is an area called Valle dos Vigiedos, which is just around the corner, not so far from where I was born, where the Italians are. So it's this area here. So let's have a glimpse at that area, how it looks there. This is the wine area of Southern Brazil. And you see from the vegetation, this is fall, so leaves are falling, so winter is approaching. You see from the grapes as well that it was winter here, or fall, it's fall actually, when they recorded this bit in the place called Bento Gonçalves. You see even the fountain in town is resembles wine, a barrel of wine, so Garibaldi is also nearby. You got all fantastic caverns and Italian wines. There's another place called Villa Flores, more countryside that also has lots of vineyards. This is, they call it the, the, the wine route of the river. Okay, so this is a report we will not 
Eu vou mostrar para vocês um roteiro muito legal de enoturismo aqui no sul do Brasil, na região da Serra Gaúcha. Para quem é fã de vinho, esse roteiro é muito legal. A gente visitou várias vinícolas. Okay, this was just for you to have a glimpse, and there is another, another one that shows you the same in the Brazilian Tuscany. Okay, this is also the mountainous area of Rugan de Sul. This is actually the road I take when I go and visit my parents. And that's when you're coming down the mountain, going towards the coast. All what I'm telling you here today is also a little bit personal because it affects uh, me personally. Um, as I told you, I was born in this area, and uh, I was born in this area, but I have a place in Curitiba, which is here. And all that is in the south of Brazil. And when I want to go from Curitiba down to the place here where my parents live, I have to drive all day. So it's usually a, a ride of 11 hours, 12 hours, depending on traffic, when I go along the coast. Okay. And so it's like 800 kilometers distance to go that. And if you look at the bigger picture of Brazil, this is just the south of Brazil. So up here at the border of Guyana, all this is Brazil too. I'm just talking about this little area here, but it's relatively little. It's bigger than many countries in in the world, right? Also, something that you might not expect because you always have in mind that Brazil is like a tropical area. This is what can happen in the south of Brazil in the winter. This was 2013. It's a private video, obviously not of very good quality, but how it can be in the south of Brazil in the winter. The same out of area tree here in the back, covered by snow. Okay, so this is very common. Coisa linda, 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 linda. Also, here another video and portrays the same. So, it was 2021, last year actually. And obviously those cities where the snow falls, they make um, they make big money in the winter because all tourists from the north of Brazil, from Sao Paulo, from Rio, they like to come down to the south of Brazil to experience the cold weather. We just want to run away, but they pay for it. And hotels are always full and people just expecting, is it snowing when I'm there? Is it not snowing? I hope it's snowing so I can see snow the first time in my life. Things like that. So it also becomes a... The tourist product in southern Brazil, uh, the snow, okay? Uh, this is also in the same area, Gramado, as I told you. Gramado is about 20 kilometers away from where I was born. And Gramado is very um, German and Italian mix. And this morning, it's like one. I'd like to show this is towards the end, where they show some pictures of the planet. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. So the guy ro rides around in Gramado. It's the hotel. We fixed. decided to uh, take the back roads. Look at these houses. I could live here. I could live here, definitely. Now the question is, why don't Same I, why am I stuck 
in that horrible town I live in, in Sao Paulo, I could be living here. Oh, goodness. Look, for sale. For rent. There's a little church chapel thing over there. Let's go and have a look. Is this a house? Oh, no way. <coughs> this is a house. <coughs> it is a house and a dog. Okay, just for you to have an idea, a glimpse of uh, how the city looks like, if you actually look at Gramad and check the pictures, you will find out more how the city uh, looks like. But it's very uh, kind of... Uh, European style because it's influenced by Europeans, of course, by Italians and by Germans, more by Germans actually. And it could be some uh, place in uh, down in Bavaria or something like that in, in Germany, right? So if you look at that. So this is another big thing. Gramada is also, you see a big Christmas tree there, so they make a big Christmas festival there. Uh, okay, the last thing I would like to show you is a bit of Blumenau. And Blumenau is, if we go back to our map, is the city of German influence in Santa Catarina. Here you see it, Blumenau, we're going to Blumenau. And Blumenau has the second biggest Oktoberfest in the world after Munich in, in Germany, right? So let's have a glimpse at Blumenau. Bon dia, herzlich willkommen in Blumenau. My name is Lisette Zimmermann. Eltern sind vor fast 100 Jahren aus Deutschland gekommen und ich möchte euch gerne eine der deutschesten Städte in Südbrasilien zeigen. Kommen Sie mit! Wir beginnen jetzt auf unserer Hauptstraße. Sie wurde früher die Wurststraße genannt, weil sie lang und krumm ist. Und hier befinden sich auch etliche Fachwerkhäuser, aber sie sind nicht so alt wie in Deutschland. Das ist nun das bekannteste Gebäude in unserer Stadt, das Flächen Wellmann. Nachbildung des Rathaus in Michelstadt im Süden Deutschland. Heute leben in Blumenau ungefähr 350.000 Menschen. Viele leben von Tourismus. Denn der deutsche Flair hier in unserer Stadt zieht viele Besucher an. 1850 gründete der deutsche Apotheker Hermann Blumenau die Stadt, daher der Name. Diese Region im Bundesstaat Santa Catarina wurde das Zentrum der deutschen Einwanderer. Fast 25 Kilometer entfernte Stadtzentrum liegt Villa Itofab. Es sieht hier noch so aus wie früher, als die ersten Kolonisten sich hier ansiedelten. Es ist ein beliebtes Ausflugsziel. Außerdem gibt es eine Wanderroute. Damit kann man die ganze Gegend entdecken. Einmal im Jahr das Oktoberfest mit fest, fast 600.000 Besuchern und es ist das zweitgrößte Volksfest in Brasilien nach der Karneval in Rio. So you see, it's the second largest popular das party after Carnival in Brazil. Es ist ganze Jahr geöffnet. Wir haben hier Restaurants, Trachtenmodegeschäfte, Souvenirs und hier ist immer viel los. Viele kommen in Trachten. Für die Blumenauer ist es eine Tradition und für die Besucher ein Spaß. Außerdem, die in Trachten kommen, zahlen in gewisse Tage kein Eintritt. Hoffentlich hat es Ihnen gefallen. Kommen Sie doch mal vorbei, besuchen Sie uns. Auf Wiedersehen. Okay.
Okay, so um, obviously the south of Brazil has a lot of things to offer. Let me pause it. Let me pause it here. Has a lot of things to offer. I could present you another fifty different types of dishes and another fifty different attractions, but we just have an hour and a time here, right? Uh, or cities, or talk about our mixed culture we have in the south of Brazil. Uh, unfortunately, we just have an hour to present that. So this was a selection I made to give you an idea about how uh, southern Brazil, that is not so well known, uh, looks like. Because people usually know better. They hear about the Amazon. They know something about the Amazon. They hear about Rio. They hear about Carnival or the Afro-Brazilian uh, culture of the northeast of Brazil. And people don't know so much about the south of Brazil. So that's why I thought of also having a session on the south of Brazil. So if you don't have or didn't have a good idea on how the south of Brazil looks like to give you this idea. So I now open the floor for comments or uh, questions. So feel free to ask or comment. Yes, Marilani. Uh, hi, Marco. Um, hi, hi. Well, nice presentation, uh, however, like someone told about the song in the video, sometimes you cannot really hear what you saying, but I know that area because I'm from Vacaria, that one that place that has snow, in, so I spend all my, uh, my life when I used to live there, I have snow during the winter, very cold. Uh, but uh, another thing that, uh, for example, Vacaria has that is very cultural, that is the Rodeio Criolo. Yes. Rodeio Criolo is an a international uh, rodeo where uh, people from Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, all gauchos from the South America come for this event every two years, I think. They have this very traditional and uh, traditional music, I think like that, is very different from the uh, from other parts of Brazil, the type of music. I, I just adding something for your presentation. Yes, yes actually, actually yeah. the, gaucho, the gaucho tradition we got more in common sometimes with Uruguay and Argentina than the rest of, of Brazil when it comes to the real gaucho culture, yes. Yes, music, uh, uh, sometimes even the way to speak some words and things like that. But uh, I am real pleased to see uh, your presentation. I am going to leave it there. <laughs> Somewhere okay. else to say something. Yes, so okay. Paul, Paul has a question or a comment. Go ahead, Paul. Hi, 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 Marco. I, I didn't really plan to stay because I've been in meetings all day long, but I was really, really impressed by what I saw. Um, are you considering organizing maybe a trip as, as, as a part of this exercise somewhere maybe down the road? Because I mean, now that there's Copa and there are flights to South America, you know, I, I'm suddenly anxious to go. So, you know, think, think, think about that. Because you I think, I, you you know. think about it, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, good stuff. That's just that's all I wanted to say. But I, I really enjoyed it. Though. Perhaps a good idea would be going in October, right? So you can enjoy also the Oktoberfest, not just churrascos and all that. <laughs> not a bad idea, you know. Beer and steak, you know. Sounds like my kind of food. <laughs> <laughs> on, 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 on okay. another side, Marco, some, someone tells me that, that you're a great cook, so maybe we might even have to go to Brazil to experience some of the food. Maybe you can whip some up for us. Again, something to think about. <laughs> Thanks again. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, more comments or questions? Yes, Marcos, we would like you to prepare some yeah. of the lovely churrasco that you guys make that way. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> yeah, getting, we, get, we can get the right beef in Barbados from the Ministry of Agriculture and that makes a good churrasco here. I, I just, it's not, not so easy to find the wooden charcoal here, uh, but it's possible as well. I mean, uh, it's so much better than when it's done on. Gas or something like that. 
Yes. Okay. Other comments? Other questions? If not, so that's it then for today. I thank you for being here. Next week, I probably will have a guest from the US, a specialist in Brazilian cinema, and she will talk about uh, Brazilian cinema next week. Ariel, Isabel, do you want to say something? I saw you open your microphone. Thank you. Merci, Marco. Merci, Marco. Thank you very much. It was a very, very good, very interesting presentation. Yeah. We were very surprised, actually. Yes, by it's, what it's very different from what I imagined. I mean, I've traveled to Brazil a long time ago, a long trip in the north, in the Amazonia, and on, in, on the coast, and, and it, it's very different from what I experienced. Very, very different. You have a huge yeah, country, very diverse. As we say, Brazil is very diverse. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, And I want to show you one side of my country that is not so well known. Yes. Yeah, we appreciate Thank you very much, Marco. You're welcome. Any other comments? If not, no. So as I said, next week we probably will talk about Brazilian cinema with a specialist in Brazilian cinema. I hope to see you again. And that's it from me. And I say, boa noite, uh, ciao, and thank you for being here. See you next week. Thanks, Marco. Well done. Thank you. Boa noite. Oh, Quero um boa churrasco. <laughs> <laughs> Olha, estou esperando para o churrasco, Marco. Não quero correr. Boa tarde. Ok, podemos conversar. Tchau, ah, tchau. tchau.